was super clear that I have like 20 minutes for my talk, so I'm making a game time decision. This talk is now four minutes long, and then I'm just gonna spend 16 minutes hugging everyone in this room. <laughs> and if you are not into that, this is just like yoga. You just close your eyes, you raise your hands, <laughs> and I will not respect your boundaries because <laughs> that's my face on the screen, okay? This is my time. The doors are locked. Everyone stay in their seats and like maybe even like move in. So there's some on the edge. I don't know. We're in Minnesota. Um, anyways, uh, you might know me from the internet, just like uh, my hometown. Um, I'm behind such hits as my boyfriend got brain cancer, and because love is like so rare in this cold, dark world, it was it was local news. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was local news. They're like, two people love each other tonight at 10. <laughs> like, that was my interview. I was like, we're getting married <laughs> tomorrow. Um, or my husband had a seizure, and instead of towing our car, um, a stranger moved it to a parking lot, left a note in his pocket, and again, because our world is such a cold, dark place, when I posted that on Facebook, it went viral, and people were like, someone was nice. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, they were. It was really great. Um, or uh, my husband died, and we wrote his obituary together. And because the world is a cold, dark place, and uh, Gwen Stefani never replied, by the way, Never acknowledged. I know. I know. And we see where she ends up now, okay? <laughs> so, just gonna say. If I mentioned you in an obituary. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for a response. Um, obviously, priorities. Um, or some dummy tells me to smile and I write about it on the internet and because the world is a cold dark place and like people still like hate women. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It's a, it's a fun time to be a female, let me tell you. Um, they're like, stop having opinions. And I was like, oh my god, you're so, I'm so exhausted. Um, or, I mean, this is Minnesota, so uh, maybe we went to high school together, or like you worked with my mom. <laughs> maybe you are my mom. She usually doesn't come to stuff like this, but she's there. Woo. Um, or maybe you worked with my sister, or I probably dated you. I see like at least three people fall into that category, so. <laughs> You're looking fine. <laughs> How's your mom? Um, but I'm here today to talk about time, uh, which is kind of like one of those things, like both seasons of True Detective, that nobody understands. Uh, but we just talk about to make us sound interesting or more intelligent. Uh, but it's always been an obsession of mine. Since I was a child, I had this uncontrollable feeling that there wasn't going to be enough time and that it was moving too fast and that eventually I would die and all my things would be in a landfill and I'd just be dust floating through space. So I was just a normal child, as this page from my diary will help me illustrate. <laughs> I, was, I was just normal and totally well-adjusted. <laughs> I was great. I was great. Um, and yeah, you know, I should have been doing more with my life. Like, 10 was not my most productive year. And I think most of us can agree that we probably haven't met a very impressive 10-year-old. But um, 
I don't prove me wrong. She'll, there's none of them here. Like, <laughs> so point, point proven. Um, anyways, that, that obsession with time was always with me. It was always nagging me. Like, I have basically no memory from graduating college, I mean, for a lot of reasons. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I don't remember, like, the ceremony. I don't remember saying goodbye to my friends. I just remember driving my Honda Civic from Ohio to Minneapolis, chain smoking, camel lights that I got for free in Ohio. They just give you cigarettes. It's a weird thing. Um, and, and crying and listening to a mix CD that I'd made that was just 12 tracks of Landslide. <laughs> <laughs> so not a mix, <laughs> is what I would say. Um, and you know, Stevie Nicks would be like, can I handle the seasons of my life? And I would be like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so, I'm 22. Like, where am I going besides Minneapolis? And like. 22 is like basically 25. After 25, you're 30. Oh, and then after 30, you're 40. After 40, you're like 50-ish, 60-ish. And then you're like 75. And then like, who knows? Like, all your stuff is in a landfill. You turn to dust, you float through space, and it doesn't mean anything. So I went from like a well-adjusted child to like a well-adjusted adult, and I Invite me to a dinner party. <laughs> I'm fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm so fun. Um, but I don't know. I was just always convinced that there wasn't enough time. But yeah, I don't know. Like, if I had to choose like, an artist's rendition to like, illustrate my lifestyle, like, it would for sure be this. Like, that's just like, what I look like when I wake up. I'm just like, <laughs> we're going to do it all. Like, I have this disease called. Uh, ATT, ATT, and it means like I have to do all the things all the time, and I, I, I just, I just have to. It's like this crazy compulsion. But the one thing that was never true about me is that I've never believed that there was going to be like a specific right time for anything, like for better, or for worse, and like mainly worse. I would say, I just always let myself believe that like. If it was time, it was the right time. Like, everything is always coming up, Nora. Always. <laughs> like, I don't have that internal monologue that so many people I know have that things should happen in a specific order and that all the dominoes have to line up. I don't understand dominoes, but, like, I just don't feel that way about time. I just believe in myself, like, I would say blindly. Like, <laughs> You know, like a healthy amount of delusion, I think, is very important. Like when you're 22 and you move to New York with like two suitcases and like $400, like you're Five O Mouskowitz, and you're like, how much money could you need? Or when a new job opportunity came up, I was always like, I'll take it. That sounds good. Or when, you know, I was like dating someone, it like turned out like he like liked me, but he like loved pot. Uh, it's like, bye. Uh, or when I'd been in New York for five years and Minneapolis started to look really appealing, I left. Or when I was standing in a crowded room and a man I didn't know walked up to me and said my three favorite words, you're Nora McNerney. <laughs> I am. I just went with it. And my love story with Aaron is a legend now. And it's impossible for me to talk about time without talking about uh, my time with him. When we met, um, he had just gotten out of, a, I mean, like a long-term relationship, like longer than most of your marriages. <laughs> um, <laughs> zing. Uh, and I felt like, you know, I felt a lot of things. Like one, I stalked her, and like unfortunately for me, like she looked like Mandy Moore, and I was like, good, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> like, you're cute. Um, but I also felt like like a normal person for the first time. I was like, uh, not, not the right time. So I told him that. I was like, you know, dude, is this still working? No, yes. Um, no, it's not. 
Is that, do we want to use this one instead? Yeah? Yeah? OK. Um, really killing some of my punchlines here. <laughs> I'm going to roll that back. I'm going to start over. OK. Um, OK, so I told him that. I was like, no, 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 dude. Shut it down, emoji. I was like, we are, you're, here's what we're going to do. You're going to go. You're going to bang a bunch of chicks. And then you're going to call me. Because then you're going to be ready for me. And he did not do that. Uh, he took me out again the next night. And actual second date photo. Uh, and he won Blingo. Like, nobody wins Blingo. Like, I didn't win. Um, he took me out the next day, and the next day, and the next week, and then it had been a year, and we moved in together, and in a turn of unrelated events, he had a seizure the next day. <laughs> and uh, it turned out that um, the reason for the season The reason for the season <laughs> was that he had a brain tumor. And the brain tumor was brain cancer. Uh, and that's, uh, that's bad, just so you know. That's like nobody's ever like, yeah, I had brain cancer, and everything was fine. It's for sure not good. Um, so we did what conventional wisdom would probably tell you to not do, um, which is we got married. And we got married like three days after he started chemo and radiation. Uh, and then we had a baby. I got a, or I mean, not like right away. Like I got pregnant first. Um, and I got pregnant when he was on chemo and radiation, which is atypical, I would say. And also like not super like advised, I would say, like by the medical community. Like I was like for sure more jazzed about it than all of his doctors who were like, mm. Good, that's good. Um, but, you know, it was good. Um, I quit my job again. <laughs> I was like seven months pregnant. I was like, I've got an idea. <laughs> I'm out of here. Um, and then, then we had a baby. I got pregnant first, like as I, as I told you. Um, and Ralph was born three weeks after his father had his skull sawed open for the second time. He spent the first two years of his life in a lot of hospital rooms watching his dad get chemo and radiation or get his blood drawn. That was just what we did with our time. So three years later, after that first trip to the emergency room, we were back in that exact same room. And this time, we weren't there to find out that our lives were about to change. We were there to find out that Aaron's life was going to end, that there wasn't anything else to do except to go home and enjoy whatever time he may have left. So we did. But first, we went to Bandbox Diner and ate pancakes because that's actually what you do. You do things that are normal. And by normal, I mean like you have to like pick your husband up like a figure skater while he's yelling like, watch out for my nuts. <laughs> and you're like, there's a snowbank. Stop yelling. Um, <laughs> but that was, like that is actually what you do. Like that Tim McGraw song that's going to be stuck in your head now is a lie. Like when you live like you're dying, it's not all like climbing mountains and jumping out of planes. Um, it's just being alive. There's actually no such thing as a fucking bucket list once you actually see the fucking bucket coming. That's not how it works. So. Like I said, um, I'm just a normal person. <laughs> I'm just a normal person. And Erin and I did all of the normal things that you can expect somebody to do when they're dying. We spent a lot of time in hospitals. We spent a lot of time watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We spent a lot of time just sitting silently on the couch, looking at our own Instagram feeds. 
So I'm here to tell you that that is a perfectly acceptable thing to do with your one wild and precious life. <laughs> okay? All right, Mary Oliver, just relax. <laughs> like, we're doing the best we can here. So, um, Aaron died a year ago, and in that time, I don't know, time's just been playing tricks on me. Like, it stood absolutely still, and it's completely sped by, and like, I'm never, ever sure what day of the week it is. Like, I've heard a lot of stuff about Friday today. <laughs> but I'm getting like a strong Tuesday vibe, and <laughs> I think it's because I got showered, <laughs> and like, <laughs> I, uh, Put on, put on this outfit, so. Um, but I don't know, like I'm, I'm doing like basically fine-ish <laughs> to, to use like a medical term, <laughs> like to be very specific, like I'm like fine-ish, like it's, you know, like I mean I recently wrote like 1997 on a check, but I was also writing a check, so it could have been 1997 <laughs> at that moment. I was like, why do you need this? <laughs> Also, how did I even find this checkbook? It was like, whew, dusty. Um, but yeah, through any, through any measure, I know that we did not get enough time together. We didn't get old together or, or like middle-aged together. We didn't even get to like our late 30s together. Um, and yeah, people like say stuff like, it was just his time, and I'm like, Cool, cool feedback. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That feels better, knowing that. Uh, it wasn't his time. Like, we didn't have enough time. But it was really, really good time. And I think that counts, too. I'm still like this. Like, this shit does not always make you wiser. <laughs> and I still don't wait for the time to be right. And I never, ever will. After Aaron died, uh, I quit my job again. <laughs> and I did that because when I was talking to my accountant, uh, she was very, very excited about me being uh, like an unemployed, widowed mother who stays home while her son goes to daycare all day. Like she was definitely into that. <laughs> She was like, you could also work. And I was like, I don't know about that um, right now. <laughs> Just keep running, keep pushing those calculator buttons. I don't, I don't even know if she has a calculator. Probably, she probably does it all by her head. Um, I signed a book contract with HarperCollins, and I spent six months doing this with my computer, <laughs> OK? <laughs> Anytime you see somebody in public looking at their laptop, they're just taking photo booth photos of themselves. <laughs> like, in glasses they don't need. It turns out I have a lazy eye. It, it, it sees fine. I just have to do like these eyeball exercises. That's it. I was like, oh, <laughs> embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but they look so cute. Um, but yeah, I did that, and then I also did write a book, and I spent that first year just excavating those diamonds from the dark parts of grief and binding them into a book that I describe as like a humorous account of my husband and dad dying after my miscarriage. So it's funny. <laughs> and <laughs> It's like all the top people are like, if you're trying to succeed in comedy, make sure you hit these three topics. <laughs> Uh, it's going to occupy like, this very small space in culture that's like right between sad and funny and it's just like my book and then seasons one and two of Transparent, <laughs> which is like, it's like in the comedy section, but you're like, this show makes me cry. <laughs> Only. Um, yeah, so I started a little business and then I turned it into a nonprofit not because I had a ton of time, although I quit my job, so I do. I do. I, got, I have the time. <laughs> I have the time. If I didn't go to Michael's whenever I do, which is none of your business, frankly, <laughs> like, <laughs> I have a lot more time. I have a lot more time. Uh, but oh, there's so many things you might need if you ever decide to be crafty. 
Like, if you want, if you want the option to pursue craftiness, you belong at Michael's. Um, and I didn't do it because I know what I'm doing. I, that's, not, that's not the case. Um, but I felt like it needed to be done, and it needed to be done now. Um, I bought my second house, which is frankly just a brag. Like, guess what, men? We can do that. We can also vote. Soon I'm going to be driving a car. <laughs> so how about that? And not because like any mortgage companies were like super excited about like giving me money. They're like, you don't have a job. And I was like, I, I get it. Like, relax. I'm telling you I'm going to pay it. Like, It worked. If you just do this enough in someone's office, they're like, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, not because like anybody wanted me to, but because it was time for Ralph and I to have a life of our own and a house of our own. So now we do. And uh, okay, so you know how at TJ Maxx there are all of those uh, there's all those signs. There's so much. TJ Maxx, let's talk about it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you Max and Easter, what? Um, but you know how like there's all those like fake hand painted wooden signs, and they say things like it's it's uh, it's your life, it's a journey, and like things are things are wonderful today, or like they just say like coffee, like. <laughs> Okay, like someday I want to have a house big enough where I just like label things. Like, this is where I put my sign that says coffee, because coffee maker. Um, so, like, regardless of how those signs make you feel, which, like, to me is kind of like, how as a society did we end up at this place where, like, we're like, guys, decor wise, here's what I'm thinking. It's just like, it's just, okay, think. It's just black. It's just like black wood, and then you just write as many words on it as possible. <laughs> well, like, where do you put that? You put them everywhere. There's like, there's not a wrong place to put this sign. Like, I mean, they can go in your bedroom. They can go in the kitchen. If you have six in the living room, you're rich. <laughs> um, and even if those signs do make you question, like, you know, uh, just humanity in general, um, those signs are, I mean, they're kind of right. There's like nothing untrue on any of these signs. <laughs> like, that is coffee. <laughs> it is wine o'clock, okay? <laughs> it is. Um, because like for each of those like sort of big reckless life things I was telling you about, there's always somebody who would take me aside, uh, not in real life, but you know, people don't do that anymore, but like on Facebook and be like, Nora, are you uh, sure it's like the right time to do this? Like, maybe you should wait. And it's like always someone who like hasn't been through what I've, I've like been through. I'm always like, oh yeah, like what did you do when your husband died? Oh my God, he's alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for that advice. Um, and I don't know, I like always said the same thing, which is like, I don't fucking know. Like, I don't know. I just know that there's never going to be enough time and there's never going to be a right time. Not to get married, not to have a baby, or quit your job, or start something new. Or even like, you know, to like dump a boyfriend because you're like, what do you like more? Like me or pot? And he's like, Nora, that's not fair. And you're like, <laughs> It's not, <laughs> um, but it's really easy. I mean, it's easy for me even to get caught up in the idea of perfection and the idea of things turning out exactly as you want them to and looking exactly like you want them to because we are afraid. We're afraid of things like failure and we are afraid <laughs> of dying, and we are probably more afraid of giving our love to somebody who we might have to walk to the edge of this world and watch fade into the next one. And I think that's what we're saying when 
we see something that we want to do and we say it's not the right time, like the timing is wrong, we're just saying that we're scared. <laughs> and as somebody who has spent the better part of you know, the time she could be spending hugging you, uh, telling you about all of the reckless things that I've done, but who is, for the most part, according to her therapist, like pretty okay. <laughs> Just don't be, which, you know, like everything those TJ Maxx signs are trying to tell you is way easier written on a TJ Maxx sign than done. But you are going to end up wherever you end up and you're probably going to be fine and you're probably going to make the best of it because like the alternative is like <laughs> going to get exhausting after like 12 times, <laughs> a hundred, 112 times. You're going to live and you're not going to live like you're dying. So to wrap it up, and get to you the, I mean, what I can tell is a hotly anticipated hug sesh. You can just tell. <laughs> like, just the vibe that is coming, just this direction. I'm like, whew, whew. And with, I don't know, like, apologies to clocks and philosophers and scientists and therapists and, you know, even, like, reasonably intelligent people, like everyone in this room, Timing isn't everything, it's nothing at all. Thank you. <laughs>